mute. Yeah, okay. So, um, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to today's data learning talk. So today, we're well, very happy to have um, Sandeep B. George from the University uh, College London. And today he will talk about augmenting the prediction of extubation failure using measures of complexity. So uh, Sandeep, I will leave the audience with you. Uh, thanks so much. Um, okay, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Sandeep and as um, Sipa just mentioned, I, I work at the, at the University College London um, in, in a group um, called Chimera. And what we what we basically do is we we use data from ICUs to sort of um, to understand um, patient outcome in general and to try and predict those. Uh, before UCL, I, I I was a postdoc at the at the University College Groningen in in the Netherlands, where I used to work on dynamical systems uh, models of depression and mental health in general. And before that, I was at the Indian Institute of Science um, uh, Education and Research in, in Pune in India, where I used to work on dynamical systems in the context of um, astronomy. Um, so, so what I'm going to be talking about today um, is I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, how we can predict um, uh, extubation failure in the ICU uh, using some complexity measures. And this work um, was done in collaboration with um, Kevek, uh, who's a PhD student, um, Simon, who's um, Simon Arij, who's a professor of computer science, and uh, Shamiran Roy, who is a clinician at the Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children. Um, so let me start with um, some background about what extubation is. Um, so uh, in, in the ICU, uh, you would need mechanical ventilation for a large fraction of, um, of, of patients who are in, in the ICU. So th this fraction can be quite high. It can be as high as about 40% uh, of, of all patients at any given hour. Um, now, at, at some point, you would want to remove uh, this ventilatory support. And removing this ventilatory support too early or too late can really lead to uh, often fatal outcomes. Um, and what we describe as an extubation failure is when the, the re-intubation, that is when you need to insert the tube back again, has to happen within 24 to 72 hours. So this definition sort of varies between studies. So some studies would put it at 24, some at 48, some at 72. In our study, we put it at 48. Um, now, these rates of failure can be can be quite uh, it sort of also varies depends on on your cohort that you're looking at. So it can be between two to twenty five percent failure, and a bunch of reasons um, are there for why this failure happens. One is there could be an imbalance between the the respiratory muscle capacity and the work involved in breathing. Uh, it could be because of an upper airway obstruction. It could be because of um, some kind of excess respiratory secretion can be because of an ineffective cough that's not able to remove uh, anything that's stuck in your in your um, in your windpipe um, it can be due to um, cardiac dysfunction or some kind of brain damage um, so failed extubations are a problem for a bunch of reasons it, it leads to uh, higher hospital mortality um, it could also lead to an increased length of stay in the ICU and which leads to increased costs. Um, and it leads to a prolonged duration for, of, of mechanical ventilation and a heightened risk of, um, of a tracheostomy. So that's like you, you add the risk to sort of um, insert uh, another tube through your throat uh, to your uh, windpipe um, through surgery. Now, there are, there are lots of risks that are associated um, with, well, uh, a lot of risk factors uh, for extubation failure, if you have a medical history, if the patient is too young or too old, um, if you've been mechanically ventilated for too long before, um, and if there is, um, if you if you have a continuous sedation, right? So all of these are risk factors for for extubation failure. Um, <clears throat> with that, let me go to some attempts at uh, at predicting extubation using machine learning. 
Um, so because this is again, as uh, for the reasons I mentioned before, such an important um, such an important thing to predict. Uh, people have been using a large number of of machine learning algorithms to try and predict extubation outcome, and these include um, logistic regressions, support vector machines, random forests, uh, neural networks, gradient boosting, and so on. And um, the the success of these methods has also been slightly varied, where AUCs range between 0.6 to 0.98. Although the the higher end, I, I would sort of take with a pinch of salt because um, a lot of those studies seem to show um, some amount of flawed methodology, uh, which I will elaborate a little more when when I talk about the method sections in in my slides. Um, yeah, so so the, the next part, let me let me just quickly uh, give a little bit of background also in terms of how much complex dynamical systems have been used in the context of extubation. So there's actually limited literature on on using dynamical systems to predict uh, extubation failure in general, but um, there has been a little bit of work on using symbolic dynamics in in smaller data sets uh, with with a little bit of accurate with fair accuracy. Um, now with with um, there's been some amount of um, work that also shows that the entropy or the complexity of breathing patterns, that could be actually smaller in, in patients who, um, who, uh, who, have, who undergo extubation failure. So people who, who fail extubation are more likely to have a lower complexity of breathing patterns. Um, okay. So now uh, I'll, I'll quickly talk about what our data is like. So our data is from the Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children. Um, all the patients that were admitted into the ICU between 2016 and 2018, which number about 5,600 individuals, we have data for all of those people. Uh, we have, uh, out of these, we had to exclude about 3,000 patients because A, they either didn't need uh, mechanical ventilation or they didn't have sufficient data or the excavation time could not be determined with sufficient accuracy. So uh, often, you know, you the records of when the excavation happened is often written down by hand. And, and uh, we have reason to believe that maybe these records may not be always correct. Um, and some of them actually just uh, died in care, right? Um, and in our, in, in our study, again, like I mentioned, the failure uh, is when the reintubation occurs within 48 hours of extubation. In our uh, data set, we have 95.5% successful extubation. It's about 2,500 patients and 119 sort of failed extubation. So that's about 4.5%. So it's a highly imbalanced data set. Um, what is the kind of uh, data that we have? We have static data, basically things like the age, the sex, the ICU stay duration, the ICU ward, and so on. So um, the ICU stay duration is important because as, um, as I was mentioning earlier, in, um, in the risk for, for increased uh, extubation failure, the longer you have mechanical ventilation, the, the more likely you are to fail extubation. So ICU stay duration is, 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 an, is an important variable. The ICU ward is important because the different wards admit patients with different severity um, of, of disease. So, so depending on which ward you're in, you are at a heightened risk for, um, for, well, for, for extubation failure. Um, we also have time series data. We have the heart rate data. We have blood pressure data. We have respiratory rate data, and we have oxygen saturation data. And in the right, um, these panels over here, you can actually see the, the heart rate, the respiratory rate, and blood pressure for about one day from a single patient. Um, and you can see again that there are a lot of um, extremes that sort of happen in between. So there's a lot of pre-processing that, that, that needs to be done. Um, yeah, so for the static characteristics, uh, the, the, the age and the, and the sex characteristics of the failed and successful extubation group is what I'm showing here. Um, the successful, uh, in the successful extubation group, the median age was about 306 days. So that's about a little less than a year. And the failed is not very different. It's about 297 days, so about nine days younger. So, um, this is not significant, um, if you do a t-test. So, 
So these two are um, so more or less the, the, the same age. Uh, again, the, the, the sex distribution um, is, is also not very different. 95.3% uh, of, uh, of males failed extubation while nine, uh, succeeded extubation. Sorry, that's, you've, I've mixed up the colors a little bit over there. And 95.7% of, of females succeeded extubation. Um, so this also is not, is, is not significant. Um, okay, so next I'll sort of come to the, the complex variables um, in the data. So we use a, lot, a, a number of complex variables that are derived from the heart rate, the respiratory rate, and the blood pressure. Um, and uh, we, we look at the data 24 hours before an extubation. So we identify the extubation time, take a day before this, and then use that much amount of time series to derive the complex variables. Uh, we use three variables mainly, um, so three into three, about nine, um, which is the, the fractal dimension, the entropy, and the mutual information. So the, the, the fractal dimension um, is the extent to which a system occupies its face space. Um, so let me try and explain what that means a little bit. So uh, in, in the right panels, again, you can, you can see the, the Lorentz system. What I've plotted is the, is the X times series of the Lorentz system and um, the X by Z of the of, um, phase space of the Lorentz. So if you look at it, you, you can immediately see that, um, that, the, that, the, um, that the system does not occupy the entire space. Instead, it seems to occupy some fraction of the space. Now, uh, um, so crudely, what the fractal dimension does is it sort of, um, it sort of quantifies what fraction of space um, the uh, the the system occupies in some sense, and, and, and of course, if if I if I let this system evolve for infinite amount of time, it'll still occupy only the same fraction of space. That's the that's the understanding that we have. Um, the second is is the entropy, which is the which is a measure of the disorder in the system. So essentially, uh, again, if you if you look at the Lorentz system uh, time series over here, if you have a perfectly on the other hand, if you had a perfectly periodic system, then you would then the information that you require, then you know everything about its evolution, right? So you, you, there is no disorder in the system because everything about the future is already known. Um, whereas something like the Lorentz, if you look at it, um, actually has um, some amount of entropy because you don't know everything about the future by just looking at the, at the, at the present amount of time. So the amount of disorder uh, sort of is more in, in more complex systems. And finally, we also look at the mutual information between these time series. And uh, what that sort of tells you, it tells you the extent of mutual dependence between two time series. So essentially, um, it sort of tells you given information about, about the state of one of the time series or one of the systems, what do I know about, about the other system, right? So that's the that's mutual information that I get um, between two time series. All right, so I'm, I'm going to take a small detour here because, um, um, yeah, for about one slide. And I'm just going to like um, tell you some of the, well, the, the fact that you can use nonlinear time series analysis and especially some of these three variables in a, in a variety of, of, of different contexts. Um, I'm doing that mostly because uh, this is mostly work that, that, that I did in the past and find quite exciting. Um, so, so uh, I'll first talk about fractal dimensions. Um, again, this is just to give you an extent of, of like you know the different kind of fields where where this kind of work um, where this kind of measures are useful. Um, so, contact binaries are, are actually um, are variable stars, are binary stars, where um, where the both the stars are actually in contact with each other, like in the left panel that you see over here. So they have mass exchange, they have energy exchange between between each other, and it increases. Um, uh, um, yeah, yeah. So so um, this extent of contact, how close they are to each other, that sort of increases over time, right? So as the, as the star sort of evolves, um, the extent of contact sort of increases. Now. Uh, it turns out that the fractal dimension that you calculate um, from from the for the variables of this star also increases over time, and um, yeah, yeah, also increases over time. So essentially, if you if you calculate the fractal dimension of one of these stars, 
you can get a good approximation for it, what its age is. Um, the second is in the, is is uh, for entropy, and and one of the way one of the places where it's quite useful is in the context of uh, depression. Um, where you can actually show that the entropy of the heart rate dynamics um, of of individuals who are who are likely to have a depressive episode in future is significantly reduced. So, um, so if you look at this figure again over here, these are two kinds of entropies that are just plotted, and people in red are the ones who experience a transition in future. People in blue are the ones who did not, and you can see that that both kinds of entropy. Are reduced in people who experience um, a transition. Finally, um, about mutual information, um, this is to do with catastrophic events, and this is to do with a particular um, star again called Betelgeuse, which uh, in 2019, the end of 2019, underwent um, a huge dimming um, uh, in its in its light, and people thought thought that it could be a supernova and etc. and um, so essentially, um, one of the things that the mutual, if you calculate the mutual information of this of this uh, over time, then you sort of see that well before the actual dimming happened, the mutual information increased drastically uh, before the dimming. So mutual information can be used as a predictor to catastrophic events. So all of these, um, yeah. So all of that was just like show that these are useful quantifiers in a in a bunch of different um, um, fields. Yeah, so coming back to this data set, let me let, let me go back to talking about um, uh, exhibition failure and, and the variables that we're looking at over there. And what I did first um, was to do a man Whitney U test uh, for the complex variables. And I want to see how many of them are significantly different um, between the people who failed exhibition and the people who did not fail exhibition. Um, yeah, and, and and who did not fail extubation. So, um, so so let's um, so the first three are so the RR is the respiratory rate, the HR is the heart rate, and BP is the is the blood pressure. So the dimensions, all three dimensions, are not significantly different. Um, are not significantly different between uh, the people who failed extubation, people who did not. The p values are about are well over 0.25, which is the threshold we took. Um, Next with entropy, however, we find that the respiratory rate and the heart rate of the entropy are actually significantly different between the two groups. Um, the blood pressure entropy is not, although it's well, marginally there. Um, then with the mutual information, we find that the mutual information between the respiratory rate and the heart rate, the respiratory rate and the blood pressure, and the heart rate and the blood pressure, uh, all three of them are, um, are, are significantly different um, between the two groups. Um, all right, so um, so so what does this? Um, so yes, there is a significant difference between these. But I um, maybe I'll spend like a moment to just say that uh, even though it's significantly different, because we have such a large data set, the actual effect size may not be large. So this could be just a small effect, but because we have so many data points, we just we see that it's significantly different. Uh, and that's what you can see, for instance, in the in these histograms, which show the group level differences. Uh, the red shows um, the histogram of the failed extubations for the five significant quantifiers, and blue shows successful extubations for the for the different quantifiers. And you can see that um, they're barely different in in, in some sense. Uh, so if you look at the peaks, the you, you can see that um, that they don't change very much. By I, I would even say that they're not significantly different. But there is a significance over here because we have about 2000 patients and 100 in the other group. So um, so the, the takeaway being that, um, that, there is, that there is a difference which is significant, but the effect size actually is, uh, is, is fairly small. Um, however, there, there are a couple of things which are quite interesting to observe over here, uh, especially if you, if you look at um, these graphs in the bottom, which is the um, the respiratory rate, blood pressure, mutual information, and the heart rate, blood pressure, mutual information. And you can see that people who succeeded extubation also seem to have a peak um, apart from the peak at the, um, at the extreme left, which means that there is more coupling that people who succeed extubation seems to show uh, uh, a larger range of couplings 
than uh, people who who failed exhibitions. And uh, um, again, these bars are a little misleading um, because these are of course both the pro um, both the graphs are sort of um, normalized such that the total probability is one. So these numbers over here are much much higher than uh, than these numbers. Uh, the, the numbers for the blue are much much higher than the numbers for the red. So indeed, the fact that that you see the blue uh, histogram being slightly lower seems to suggest that um, um, seems to suggest that it's just more spread out than the than the red. Um, okay, so 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 that's so that's uh, so that's the essential takeaway. The takeaway is that people who succeeded excavation seems to show slightly slightly uh, higher coupling between between variables and slightly higher complexity or entropy for the respiratory rate and and the heart rate. Um, okay, so now the 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 idea uh, that, that that I have um, is to sort of start from a basic machine learning model. Um, and 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 you have a feature set uh, which does not contain any of the complexity variables that I that I talked about, and then try and add complexity variables to this basic model and see if it performs any better. And um, so this is my basic machine learning model. The feature set over here are the age, the sex, the length of ICU stay, the ICU ward, all the things I talked about a little before. For the heart rate, the respiratory rate, the blood pressure, and oxygen saturation. I take the the median the median average deviations because there are, again um, as I said there are lots of um, these little uh, blips that you see in in the time series so you you don't want them to affect our um, our, our statistics so so we take the median and the median average deviation the oxygen saturation barely changes so the mean and the standard deviation um, are, are fine in that particular case and we also look at the linear correlations between these. Um, we use uh, five machine learning models based on work that's been done before. Uh, these were the, the five most used models, which is a support vector machine, a random forest, um, an artificial neural network, which is fully connected, uh, a, a light gradient boosting machine, which is a light GBM, and an extreme gradient boosting machine. And these were the five that I used. Um, and maybe one slide to quickly talk about uh, what they are. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I, I guess this is probably most of you already know it, but uh, a support vector machine basically classifies, takes the data into a high dimensional feature set, and then draws a boundary between the different classes such that the, the, um, the, the different classes are, are furthest away from the boundary. The distance between the class and the boundary is maximized, right? So this is how it classifies. Um, the the artificial neural network is of course uh, just layers of fully connected neurons, and you sort of train the weights of these to sort of uh, minimize the loss function. Um, uh, a random forest is is an ensemble of, of decision trees, and each of the decision trees are trained on subsets of features and data, and the most predicted class by each of these decision trees is sort of used as the as a class predicted by the random forest. And finally, the gradient boosted trees um, are again ensembles of decision trees, but the learning proceeds serially and not parallelly, like the random forest. And then you are you have a new estimator at every step, which is sort of fitted to the uh, which is sort of fitted to the to the uh, to the loss in some sense. So what you what do you find is that the um, that your estimator at every step is proportional to the gradient, and hence the gradient boosted trees. Um, okay, so well, that was. Um, then we come a little bit to the to, to, to pre-processing steps. Um, two things uh, that we did: one was to sort of deal with the data imbalance. So many of the uh, of the machine learning algorithms that I talked about in the previous slide, especially things like support vector machines, are heavily affected by the class imbalance. So what we do is for the training set, we we consider uh, oversampling. Um, slash and or undersampling the training set. And what we do is we use a combination of these two. We oversample the minority class by some n percentage, and we undersample the majority class such that the data is balanced. So it's sort of like keep undersampling till you get equal proportions. And this is done only to the training set. Now, 
uh, n here is, is 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 treated as a hyperparameter, so it we train it along with the other hyperparameters using cross validation. Um, yeah. Uh, over here, let me let me just mention quickly that earlier I talked a little bit about the methodology issues in some of these uh, other machine learning uh, papers uh, that learn excavation failure. And one of the mistakes that I think that they do is they artificially reduce the variance of the entire data set because they do the oversampling slash undersampling on the entire data set and not just on the training data set. So uh, you will you will you will then train on 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 something that has reduced variance and then you will predict on something that has reduced variance and you will end up bloating up your your true positives okay um then the second thing that we do is to is to scale the data so you standardize the data that is you reduce the mean and you divide by the standard deviation uh so the data now has um um yeah is, is now between zero and one and this is again needed for for some of our features um uh, are, are required for the feature sets for some of our machine learning algorithms, um, like support vector machines and the neural network. Um, okay, so with that, I think let's let's go to the the results of this basic model. Um, it's 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 quite nice to know that even without adding any of the complexity variables, the uh, the model actually does pretty well. Um, we get AUCs ranging from, well, the highest AUC was, was 0.77 for the light gradient boosting machine. Um, and uh, the lowest is not too far behind. It's at about 0.72 uh, for, the, for the neural network. And you can sort of see, the, um, I've, I've plotted a, a cross-validated ROC for this, for this best performing uh, classifier, uh, the light gradient boosting machine. And uh, this gives like a peak sensitivity and specificity um, of about uh, 0.8 and 0 0.65, 0 0.7, some, somewhere around there, and uh, which, is, which, which, is, which is pretty decent and is actually comparable to a lot of uh, existing models as well. Um, so next we, we sort of add uh, complexity variables to this model. And what we do is we sort of have an ensemble of complexity models in some sense. We, we start from the basic model and we add one variable so this is the whole algorithm for it. We add one complexity variable to the basic model, and then we calculate the AUC. Then we check if we are out of variables. If we are not out of variables, we add another variable. We keep doing this. And we choose a model with the best AUC. So what this results in is it results in a large, in, in machine learning models, which have, um, which have basic plus one, basic plus two, basic plus three um, complexity variables, and then and then all of them having a different AUCs. And then we, we sort of um, show that, that uh, we pick the model with, uh, with the best AUC as being the best model in some sense. So um, this, is the, this is the result for the, for the best model. It's uh, slightly underwhelming, but it's, it's, it's also quite interesting to see that, um, um, that that most models actually showed a modest improvement, a modest improvement in, in the AUC. And this sort of varied uh, between, I think, uh, 0.1 for the support vector machine, 0.01 for the support vector machine, and 0.04 for the, for the gradient boosting. Uh, 0.04 is, is, is not bad at all. Um, uh, so at the end of it, our best performing model then becomes um, the, the, the XG boost. Um, which which uh, the cross validation curve which I've shown over here, um, the light gradient boosting doesn't show any increase in the in the AUC. Uh, it doesn't show any decrease either. Uh, it just remains the same. Uh, when we add, well, th this is the total number of variables that we had to add. So it sort of varies between zero and four. So some of them in the light gradient boosting machine, uh, the base model performed as well as, as some of the other complexity based models. Um, while in the gradient boosting, we got um, uh, that, that there was actually a significant jump, but most of the, uh, uh, as, uh, if we keep adding complexity variables, it sort of remains the same after that. Um, it doesn't increase above 0.78. Again, um, the peak sensitivity and specificity over here is again at about 0.8 and 0.65, um, maybe at 0.7. Um, so it, it doesn't offer too much of an improvement um, over, over the, the light gradient boosting model without the complexity variables, but, um, but still seems to add something 
um, overall to most models. Okay, so so well, th th that's th that's about all of it. Let me just quickly summarize uh, what we saw. Um, so so the crux of this was essentially that complexity variables computed from the vital signs, and um, they seem to significantly differ between individuals who fail extubation and the individuals who did not fail extubation. Um, then we see that the um, that machine learning models um, show promise in predicting extubation failure, as we saw in all our models, which have um, AUCs ranging above 0.7, all the way going up to 0.78. So, so it does show some amount of promise in predicting extubation failure. As um, finally. Um, we, we show that our uh, machine learning models show a modest improvement in predictive capacity when one or more um, complex variables are, are added to the model. Um, yeah, which, which we see in four out of um, five models that we used. Let me also spend a little bit of time talking about the future directions. Um, the immediate is, of course, to try and improve this model. One of the things that you see is that we need to add, uh, we could add more variables. Uh, to this. Um, just for a comparison, uh, the total number of variables, even when we use uh, all complexity based uh, variables in our in our model. So the, the largest feature set in some sense um, is, is about 25 variables. Um, while most other data sets, uh, most other machine learning methods um, that have taken a stab at this problem use between 60 to 100 features. Um, so it's 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 not for lack of trying. It's also that uh, that our data is sort of more limited than the than the data that they're using. So one thing we could do is to try and use this in in existing data sets, for instance, and see how it performs. Um, you could add more complexity mode based variables, for instance. I've only chosen three of them. You could think of long range correlations, things like. Uh, Hurst exponents, multifractal dynamics, and things like that. Um, um, yeah, um, um, multifractals or recurrence rates, um, lots of things that you can think of adding into this. Um, and of course, also to remove redundant variables. Mm, there might be a lot of complexity variables or not complexity variables, which we just end up meaning the same thing as existing variables in this. So to just do like a, a dimensionality reduction in there, that could be something that's useful as well. Um, switching out of this model, one of the other things that you could think of doing is to use, uh, from the machine learning point of view, is to use uh, features from biomechanical models of the cardiovascular system. So. Um, so currently we are using everything with real data, but we are, as, as you can see, like even when we use two years of all patients in, in the ICU in one hospital, it still gives us about 100 people who failed extubations. Um, so on the other hand, we actually have some excellent biomechanical models which can, which can model um, failure in, um, yeah, in, 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 which can model failure in, in the ICU. So one thing you could do is to try and um, is to try and um, train your machine learning algorithms with uh, with uh, features generated from these biomechanical models, and then you can try and test it on real data, right? Um, so that's uh, that's one of the things that you could do. So this was one way to get over this uh, this lack of data problem and this data imbalance problem. Um, finally. Um, is 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 to study the complexity of waveform data, uh, and what I mean by this is that um, dynamical systems and uh, things like that we're looking at fractal dimensions, which are known as dynamically invariants, um, those are essentially um, made to study responses of systems. And what we have from the ICU data right now is actually. Um, is, is, is we end up having derived data from these actual waveforms. So we don't look at the ECG, we look at the heart rate. So just the RR peaks, and then um, we cut off all the information about it. Or we look at uh, the blood pressure instead of the arterial blood flow, right? So the complexity, so studying the complexity of, of waveform data, that might be more interesting um, from a nonlinear dynamics point of view than studying these derived quantifiers. 
um, both of these last two things are something that we can do at Chimera. Uh, and we have a large biomechanical group. So this is something we could do at some point. And uh, we've also started gathering data from ICUs where we, where we store the entire ECG and the arterial blood flow data. So in the near future, this is probably something we could try looking at. Um, okay, so with that, I think I, I can conclude. Uh, let me quickly uh, tell you about the Chimera Hub. We are a hub where we, um, where we look at data from the ICUs using mathematics, mathematical modeling, uh, biomechanical modeling, as, as well as dynamical systems and, um, and uh, AI. Uh, we eventually plan to look at data from about 40,000 patients in ICUs from three different hospitals um, in London. Um, that's the website. Uh, stay tuned. We also have monthly seminars and so on. And uh, yeah, feel free to send me an email if I don't answer a question, if, if you don't get your question right now. And yeah, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Sandeep, for the very nice talk. I found it very clear and also very knowledgeable. So for the audience, um, if you have any questions, you can either raise your hands uh, and unmute yourself. Or uh, since we're recording the video, if you don't want to uh, show yourself, you can also type the question in the chat of the seminar and I will read the question out for Sandeep. And at the meantime, actually, I have a couple of, of questions, but I think mm -hmm. you have already addressed one of them when you um, explaining how to deal with the imbalanced data. Mm -hmm. I think you you said that you multiply by n, right? So make an yeah. um, no eco sampling um, rate. Yeah. So in that case, I'm thinking, um, so you, you, you're also saying that you include that as a parameter that can be trained mm -hmm. in your model. Yeah. So that means for different um, methods, for example, for the random forest, for the uh, ANN that you have used, yeah. maybe you have a different n. Right Correct. for the Correct. yeah okay so in that case it means you're not exactly using the same training data so do mm. I understand what I mean yeah, um yes we we we're not using the same we we're not using the same training data yeah that's true okay so then when you compare for example the AUC or the other metrics it's like the results from the training um so like they're not exactly using the same training data right because you uh, also trend the end mm -hmm. as a part of your model. Yeah. So just to, to make sure if my understanding is correct. Uh, uh, that's true. So, yeah. So 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 the, the, the testing okay. data is, is is of course it remains imbalanced. Okay. But um but 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 the training data is 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 different um for for the different um for the different uh, algorithms that we use. So okay. essentially um the AUCs can be compared because these are AUCs from the testing. So the testing data is 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 okay. left as it is. It's okay. we yeah. we we don't we, we don't we don't touch that. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And just by curiosity, have you uh, had a look at these number n? Do they like differ a lot from each other? Or yeah, yeah, it, it does. Uh, I mean, to be honest, um, most of the gradient boosting methods didn't need the n at all. As in, didn't uh, it? They okay. they they work with the with the imbalance classes quite well. Um, so, so what we found was that it's, it's, it's almost close to zero. So in some cases we, we, it's, it wasn't useful at all. Um, but, um, it, it did differ. Uh, and if, if I remember the ranges actually went all the way from, uh, 10% to, to 40%. Um, so, okay. so it sort of changed quite a bit. Okay. okay thanks. Um, and I think there's a question from Benjamin. So Benjamin, if you'd like to, you can unmute yourself. Hi, uh, thanks, Sandeep. That was, uh, that's great. A lot of the work you're doing is, is uh, quite similar to what I'm interested in. And, and I'm finding the same things where, for, like, for example, I, I'm doing prediction on time series data from electronic health records. And for example, the neural nets are, aren't performing as well as the, as kind of the three models, which is interesting. That is, I'm finally glad to see someone else is having the same problem as me because everyone's upset that my neural networks aren't as good, but that's okay. Uh, my my question was i was interested it looked like in your input features i don't maybe you could show me some of them again you you didn't really use very many for example ventilatory or or, or you have you yeah you've got respiratory rate for example but but for so for i'm i'm an icu doctor um gosh they'll 
they'll definitely have all the ventilatory parameters. Why did, did you, is there a reason why you chose not to include those? For example, like the tidal volume or the um, uh, rapid shallow breathing index or the FVT, all, all, all those things. Um, um, those are all the most important or the NIF, which, is, which are generally what we as clinicians would say are the most important things for deciding on extubation. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, there's, um, so, um, actually it's a, it's, it's, it's a very hand baby kind of answer. Um, the, the, the reason I didn't include that was, was the way I approached this problem initially was to just look at the, the, the complexity, uh, measures of, of most of the time series data. And which meant that I picked the data that had the most amount of, um, variation in some sense. And um, these were the three that, that that showed the maximum amount of of, of variation, but um, but 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 you're, you're you're actually right. I mean, um, variables to add to the basic model will include um, the 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 ventilatory characteristics. Great, so thank you. I do, I just don't want your model to uh, to be missing out on interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah, thank absolutely, you. absolutely. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Benjamin, for the question, and thank you, Sandy, for uh, the detailed answer. So uh, if anyone has other questions, please do not hesitate to, to raise your hands. In fact, um, so at the meantime, I still have another question, mm -hmm. uh, because I've seen your data that um, like consists of some like time series, right? so like mm -hmm. the heartbeats, etc. So I was wondering, have you tried to use, for example, the recurrent neural network, which is now like considered as one of the reference methods to, to do time series data? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, no, it's, 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 not, it's not something that, that, that I've used. Um, but in, in the group, there, there are people who are looking at, um, who, who, are, who have looked at, I, I, I know if they're doing it right now, mm -hmm. uh, where, where they did sort of look at, um, uh, recurrent neural networks to sort of um, predict um, mm. failures, um, but I'm I'm really not very sure how far they got. But they were they were looking at uh, they were looking at recurrent neural networks um, in this context. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, just just maybe a different way to to do things. And no, abso absolutely. Course, right, we can, we can uh, absolutely. Cover all the possibilities. So. Yeah, I, I I I think when you when, when you think of time series and machine learning, recurrent neural networks are the are one of the things that just like jump out, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, uh, Sandeep. So uh, let's see if there's a final question from the audience. Well, so uh, if not, I think we can end uh, today's seminar here. And thank you again for Sandeep for accepting our invitation and for giving uh, this very nice talk. And thank you for everyone who has joined us. Oh, I, oh yeah, it's just uh, Benjamin would like to thank you as well. Um, yeah, so hope everyone have a nice uh, evening. And um, yeah, hope we can one day meet in person, Sandeep. They... Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Um, so thank you everyone, have a nice evening and uh, yeah, see you, bye.